Chapter 1. Story. My memory is bad these days, so maybe I misremember things and leave things out. Also, I want to point out that this is only Lisa's version of events. It's not the truth, it's not what happened, but it's what's recorded in Lisa's brain. I am sure the others in the story would tell it completely differently. The High Board Often my parents would take us swimming in local pools. I think on a Friday or a Saturday afternoon. I think it was mostly my dad that would take us. I remember him being the shark chasing us, the joy of the game, his familiar face popping up from the water going, Rawr! Sweet. I remember one of the pools had a high diving board. There were three, a small, middle, and a very high one. My older brother, James, would run to the top one and jump straight away. I would follow him up and still be on the edge of the highest diving board on his second turn. I always wanted to follow him. I loved his courage. He seemed so brave to me. Sometimes I would sit the whole of the swimming session at the top of the high diving board waiting to jump, my feet dangling over the edge. Often, as my dad called me in, I would start crying as I climbed back down the steps. I never wanted to be afraid of anything. My brother. My brother was a beautiful child. People thought he was a girl, he was so pretty. He had deep red ringlets, large hazel eyes, and his personality was soft and giggly. He was born three years before me. I don't really remember too much from our childhood. It feels so distant now, like a distant life. But there are points that stand out sometimes, the bits that shocked me or frightened me, rather than the good memories. Shame that's what the brain records, but it's pretty obvious that's how it would work. I think the saddest memories this body has witnessed have been watching my brother. I was ten when my brother was first put into a psychiatric ward. He was thirteen. The explanation that had been given to me was that he had broken his head, like a broken arm but his head was broken. I noticed that if I told people this they would look at me with sad eyes and ask if I was okay. I didn't really understand this. I didn't understand it was bad or sad. I didn't understand that this broken head was what made him scream for hours in the night with my dad having to pin him down. I didn't understand his broken head was what made him shake with fear in the corner of the room, or have him make my gran and I wear tin foil to protect us against aliens. I thought that was just my brother. I wasn't really sure what a broken head was. I quite liked breaking my arm. I got loads of attention and presents. It hurt at first, but it made me feel important, so I wasn't sure that it was such a bad thing. I didn't realize it was bad until we left him for the first time in the hospital. The nurses had to restrain him as he screamed and begged us not to leave. I found this rather amusing, so much activity and shouting, like the TV, like Easter Enders. My mother, father, I, and my dog had to walk down a thin path to leave him screaming and banging on the glass door behind us, nurses everywhere. I heard my dad laugh, thank God. I thought it's okay to laugh, so I laughed and laughed. My mom in front of me cries, wails, like she was being killed. How odd. I went to her and I say, don't cry, mom, it's really, it's funny, really. Dad is laughing. She looks like she's going to collapse and my dad rushes forward and catches her. I look at his face. He wasn't laughing, I realized. He was crying. The guilt. I had never in my ten years experienced the agony of guilt. I felt physically sick for weeks. My parents had cried the whole way home that night in the car. I sat in the back with my dog Bonnie and burned in guilt. I thought it was funny. I thought it was a joke. But it wasn't. I had never seen them both cry before. I didn't know my dad did. I had said to them out loud that it was funny. I couldn't play with my friends at school. I couldn't concentrate. My insides ached and I just kept replaying the hour-long journey with them crying. I now knew my brother's broken head was very bad. I cried myself to sleep at night, so sad at them being sad. I wished I could take all their pain away. 
I cried and cried at the sadness of them. My parents looked so sad all the time. My mom would cry in the morning as she did her hair. I began to dream of ways I could help people. I dreamed of setting up a dog home to rescue unwanted dogs. Funny what the mind does when there is pain. One night, I plucked up the courage to apologize to my mom for laughing. We were wa watching EastEnders, and it just came out. I tried to explain to her that I didn't understand it was bad. She hugged me and told me it was all right. The guilt began to fade after this. It never really ended, my brother's illness. Well, that's what they called it. It's been 25 years now of drugs and doctors and social workers and hospitals. I can tell you the saddest tales of suffering, suffering beyond anyone's imagination, not because there was a problem in the flow, but because my brother's brain imagined problems. Hours sitting outside the hospital, in the car, crying just for the sadness of him, of knowing no matter what happened, it wouldn't make his brain tell better stories. I saw hell wasn't above the flow. It wasn't about what happened. It was about the, how the brain interpreted it. Even though society would tell you it was about the flow, I knew it wasn't. My brother saw hell when it wasn't there. My life began to get darker after that day. My parents were heartbroken, and they seemed to spend less and less time at home, of course. My disabled grand lived with us, so I was often left with her. There were good times. There were friends and boys and laughter but I was left alone more and more with my brother after he came out of hospital. Because my gran was disabled and we had a big house, she was often in the front of the house and my brother and I were in the back. Naturally, we began to act out really weird behaviors together. We argued a lot and physically fought. I used to feel so powerless around him. I began to make myself sick in secret. It was such a great great release. That sounds odd, but a lot of the time, to a bulimic, the purging is the best part. It grew and grew until I was binging and purging sometimes 10 to 15 times a day. I didn't purposely choose to become a spiritual seeker. In a way, I had to. Otherwise, I was more than likely going to die young from bulimia. But that wasn't the real spur. Actually, the question why was what got it going. Why this? I was still in my teens, and basically I had to find answers. There was no way this bundle of energy could have settled with marrying and children, or even doing the rat race. I had to know why. For ten years, it felt like I was stripped of everything that I thought I knew. It felt like I was constantly sitting on the edge of the diving board. I can't really tell you how or why it happened. It just happened like that. At points, it was very physically painful. Everything was being lost, and everything was questioned, and at points, it was very exciting. There was reading of books, listening to speakers, practicing weird practices, and living with bodies that were mostly empty of self. There were drugs, sex, booze, food, shitting, and life. Just life, which was in constant momentum of change. I never knew the way. There was always doubt. I never thought that this was the way to freedom. It happened without me knowing it was happening. Then one day, after many experiences and awakenings, everything changed. It didn't suddenly make sense. It didn't suddenly click, and there was an understanding. There was just love. Everywhere, the boundless intimacy of everything, but not for Lisa. It was everything. One day, I was inside the body, relating to the world through time and me. Then one day, that was gone, and there was everything. The aliveness was no longer Lisa's and bound inside a body. It didn't belong to a story in time, or a description in words, or a body moving through the world. It was everything and no thing, and completely, what the hell? It wasn't knowable. And this isn't some final state. In this weird reality where this world is seemingly experienced through a body, the body is changing and developing, and change and growth and realization still carry on. 
I don't see myself as liberated or unliberated. They're there or not there. Finished or not finished. I don't know where I am. I would need to know you in order to judge myself, and I don't, winky face. So now there is talking and writing about this, but there is no idea of a path or a way to this. All of it seems like a dream now, me and my life and the way through time, a dream to nowhere. Talking and listening is happening, but what is spoken of or written about is not known by someone. It can't even be known that Lisa lost everything. What a cosmic joke. And then we laugh.